Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you all here today. Uh, this is the second uh, Open Air Graph uh, community call. And with us today, we have Claudio Azzori from the Open Air Graph uh, team. Uh, he's going to uh, guide us through the graph workflows as well as the yin and yang of uh, content acquisition. So before we get into this and his presentation, I would also like to quickly uh, guide you through our new website. Uh, which we recently launched and some of the key information that you can find there. So let me quickly share my screen to give you this very brief uh, tour. Uh, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Uh, so this is our brand new uh, Open Air Graph site. Uh, so in the About section, you can find all, all the information uh, about the graph, a very brief overview of how it came about, as well as uh, deep dive into our numbers, the statistics, our roadmap, and the change log. Uh, next, we have the use contribute uh, page. So this is uh, all about how you can specifically use the graph and also contribute uh, to the graph. Uh, uh, going into this page, we've also created separate uh, guidelines, uh, depending on your stakeholder group, if you're a researcher, an institution, funder, so you can find all this information uh, there. Next, we have the community. So the, the Open Air Graph is community driven. Uh, in order to get your feedback and provide the forum for you to ask your questions, we've created a dedicated web page for that, which is the user forum. And we very much like to invite you to explore that. In this page, you can also find all the information on our community calls. Uh, past ones and uh, what's coming next. Uh, next, we have the support. So in here, you can find all the information and supporting material to help you navigate through our uh, through our graphs and uh, some frequently asked questions, supporting materials, as I said, and also uh, technical support bits. Uh, finally, we have a separate website for the documentation. So uh, we very much like to be uh, transparent about how we uh, create and also operate uh, the graph. And in the documentation, you can find all the information about how the graph was developed, API information, as well as access to our uh, data set. So uh, with this uh, very brief uh, run through through our website, I would uh -huh. like to invite you to have, a, to have a look and also pass the floor on now to uh, Claudio so he can give us his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Athena, for the introduction. And uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. It's a pleasure to uh, give you this presentation. Let me share my screen. OK, desktop share. Presenter mode. Can you see input screen? Yes, okay. yes, we're all good. Okay. Thank you. So uh, with this presentation, uh, <clears throat> I hope to clarify a bit some aspects behind uh, the process in place on how the open air graph is uh, built. Uh, everything starts uh, from the, content, the scientific content uh, available out there. So again, uh, there would be no open air, let me say this uh, clearly, without the repositories. So uh, open air leaves thanks <laughs> to the existence of the repositories. Uh, however, it's important to, uh, to note that today uh, there are also other initiatives out there uh, that do play a key role in uh, what open air does. So uh, here, why uh, we have this duality between uh, content that is considered to be uh, open and compliant coming from the repositories and content, uh, let's say, complementarily that is not open and compliant, but it is yet important. So uh, the outline for today, uh, I will uh, briefly describe uh, the open and compatible sources uh, by illustrating a bit of information on open and provide as um, some of you might already know as one of the open air services. Um, the registration process, the role of the open air guidelines, and then, as I said, the non-compatible sources, then how the graph uh, is being constructed, 
few mentions on uh, some of the ongoing and future works and then uh, leave the floor to the discussion. So um, these uh, community calls uh, are being inspired uh, by the work we are doing in, in the graph. In the documentation, you uh, and also it's part of the fact sheet, you will find uh, this diagram, this flow, that resembles uh, essentially the implementation of, of the open air graph um, construction and processing pipeline. And uh, we decided to took it as an inspiration to uh, decide which topics should be important to touch in uh, the series of, of the events. So uh, la the last time, uh, my colleague Paolo uh, in gave an introduction of what the open air uh, graph is, uh, what, what, what's the purpose, which are the principles behind uh, its conception. And today, instead, we start from this uh, part uh, of the processing pipeline from the from far left. So we're going to uh, describe uh, what the open air compatible sources, the, the role that they play, uh, and then the non-compatible sources. In the next occasion, we are going to uh, rotate with some uh, also other topics uh, that we believe are, are important. Uh, how to play with the data, for example, since the graph is all, uh, it's publicly available um, and can drive important insights. We are going to illustrate how to derive uh, some insights from subset of the graph uh, that could lead for uh, applications that you might have in mind. So again, open air compatible sources uh, leverage uh, on the open air guidelines. What are the open air guidelines? Everything started, uh, I think it was 208, uh, with the open access mandate from uh, the European Commission. Back then, uh, the intention was to uh, assess uh, the share of publication published in, in open access and uh, open has started to build on top of that. So it was important to guide repositories on how uh, to expose uh, the metadata of the, the publication they host in a, a way, in a way that it is uh, machine con processable. So uh, essentially the, the open guidelines includes a set of indications and rules um, that when followed makes uh, sim simplify uh, the, the, the work for applications that need to consume this data. And the consumption of this data uh, is, makes them uh, uh, essentially uh, capable to express, for example, the reference to a funding project or how to uh, indicate that a publication is open access or not. So. The goal, the primary goal is to have a common understanding on, on the semantic of the data, of the metadata, um, to basically improve the quality uh, of the metadata. Uh, of course, this metadata must uh, be exchanged across the systems. So um, it is based on a data representation that it is XML based. Uh, the latest version of the guideline is inspired by uh, the data site metadata format, and there will not uh, be metadata exchange without the um, use of the uh, OAIPMH protocol, which uh, essentially allows open air, but not only open air because it, it's an initiative from the open archives uh, initiative, to uh, circulate the data from the repository to uh, an aggregator like open air so open air provide uh, provide is essentially an umbrella service that covers for uh, validation of the contents available in a given repository and the registration of the repository itself uh, when um, users can uh, test the validation against a given version of the guideline and perform the registration. Um, it also features uh, the enrichments that OpenAir builds thanks to another service offered by OpenAir, which is the OpenAir Broker Service. And um, 
uh, allow us to uh, explore the usage statistics, so views and downloads uh, from the usage counts uh, service. But we are not going to cover this in today. So we, we will focus today for on, on validation and registration. So uh, the test of a compliance uh, of the contents can be performed uh, as a first step when uh, you log in into provide. It's possible to uh, verify the compliance against uh, the version of the guideline that uh, you supposedly uh, know you are compatible with and run a validation test. This will, will result in a validation report that uh, allows you to know uh, which are the rules that are well implemented on the content of your repository and which uh, rule instead are not passing or partially passing. Uh, as some rules might not be maybe applicable to all the fields in every single metadata record, while other instead are more uh, find a, a wider coverage in the contents. So the, the, the output of the validation can be seen in uh, different uh, perspectives. So on a per rule percentage of, of uh, compliance, as well as in a detailed report that provides hints uh, on one end, the validation, uh, the, the rule itself, and the reason for uh, the pass or not pass or, or the score indicated in, in the validation results. Then uh, it's possible to proceed with the registration of, of the data source. Um, OpenAir is already aware on uh, about which are the repositories because it leverages on um, registries of, of repositories, open, namely open door, R3 data, and for sharing. So these are regularly um, retrieved from, uh, from these three registries. Uh, remember that OpenAir is uh, essentially an aggregation system. So uh, it's not responsible for the uh, long-term preservation of information, especially about repositories. So it does not aim to supersede or to replace uh, the existing repositories, but instead to, uh, to uh, maybe we can say, uh, create bridges between the, these registries. Then, uh, once the repository is selected, it's possible to edit uh, the repository information. Maybe it's not that updated uh, in one uh, registry. So fill in the rest of the fields. Register an interface, so indicating which is the endpoint of the OAIPMH uh, repository. Uh, accept the terms of use and for the metadata harvesting and for the reuse of the full text. Uh, let me remember that OpenAir runs um, text and data mining algorithms on top of the publication, of the open access publications to uh, derive added value contents and uh, finalize the registration. So this is essentially what the end user perceives as a registration uh, process, which results in the end uh, in the availability of a repository uh, specific dashboard that allows to, to see uh, what OpenAir is doing with the contents of, of the repository. Illustrates the history of the aggregations, so a timeline in which um, the contents from the repository were aggregated. Um, the trend of the usage counts, uh, the amount of enrichment events uh, that one can build, downloads and views, and so on and so forth. There, there is also uh, more information uh, available in the dashboard, but this is just to uh, give you an understanding of, of the information that you might find on, on the provide repository dashboard. So behind the curtains, when a, a repository is aggregated, um, open it as a team of people, uh, that carries on uh, with the activities from that point onwards. Uh, it is based on a tool that uh, was developed uh, here at CNR uh, some years ago. It's still in operation in open air, uh, was quite heavily, I must say, specialized to handle 
the open use case, especially in terms of uh, non-functional requirements and scalability. Uh, open is uh, for sure, uh, I can say this honestly, uh, that the largest application for uh, the DNet uh, soft tool toolkit. So it was um, customized to uh, accommodate the volume of data that Open Air manages. And this is uh, just a preview of uh, a list of repositories uh, that the Open Air uh, aggregation team manages on a, on a daily basis. So when a repository is registered, then the um, aggregation managers can uh, assign an aggregation workflow to it, which is then responsible to uh, perform the aggregation tasks, which are metadata collection and metadata transformation. And here by transformation, I mean a structural and semantic harmonization. So every repository, here we see uh, the University of Minho repository has a dedicated dashboard where the operators can see uh, information on what the system is doing about uh, the repository content. So uh, since OpenAir has many, many repositories, I'll show some numbers uh, later. It's important, it's crucial to have proper support uh, on uh, automatize the processes. So that's why uh, looking farther behind the curtains, we have a workflow management system uh, as we refer to it, that allows to automatize these uh, activities. So on a regular basis, the procedures comes and contact the repository endpoint to check if there are new publications, new data set, new uh, bibliographic material to retrieve. Then again, automatically, those contents get transformed by a different process uh, to produce a, a new version of the contents to be uh, integrated in the graph. So speaking of technologies involved, uh, this diagram uh, describes briefly which are the technologies uh, that takes part here. On top, we have the DNet application that uh, in short defines an information system service that contains all the definition of the workflows, configurations, and uh, knowledge about uh, the internal services that are available in the system, a manager service, and a process orchestration service that basically implement uh, this uh, step of list of steps that you see chained with an arrow, which is indeed yet another graph, speaking of graphs, uh, implementing uh, the various logical steps that the system uh, runs to accomplish the various tasks. This is, uh, these layers are uh, based uh, on uh, Postgres database to uh, store a part of the data uh, and MongoDB uh, as a login system for uh, the workflow and for some category of uh, metadata stores as we refer to them. Then uh, some years ago, it was the time of open air advance for those who uh, knew this project. Um, we had to uh, introduce substantial changes in, in uh, the content aggregation workflows because uh, back then we started to face uh, the need to uh, have a more scalable uh, system and we opted for uh, embracing the uh, Apache Hadoop uh, environment. Today, uh, the vast majority of the largest sources, and uh, also I, I would say not only the largest one, but a substantial number of, of the data sources, is now aggregated inside the Hadoop ecosystem, where thanks to uh, coupling between the DNet uh, orchestration mechanism and the UZI workflow management system, um, the metadata collection and transformation workflows uh, run smoothly on a daily basis to get the content, to keep the contents uh, up to date. Then for the data, for the most in, uh, processing intensive parts, uh, the workflows do leverage on top of Apache Spark 
and uh, we use uh, Zeppelin as tool for um, expressing, for developing the notebooks, for uh, getting insights on the contents, so to dive into the contents. Uh, so, then, we mentioned the open and compatible sources. Now, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's not only about open and compatible sources. Uh, there are uh, important initiatives out there, um, repositories, archives, aggregator, that, uh, let's say, must be in uh, to, to, to build a data uh, in the graph that <clears throat> can be seen, can be perceived a comprehensive picture of the scientific production at a global scale. That's why in this slide uh, you see uh, players like Crossref Datasite, just to mention two important, DOIJ, Directory of Open Access Journals, various uh, funder, uh, European and international funder databases. There are uh, publishers that are onboarded, uh, other research graphs, uh, just to mention open citation uh, being an important one, uh, thematic and institutional repositories like PubMed, uh, of course, Zenodo, uh, AL, Archive. It's uh, all kind of contents that take an important role uh, in the construction of, of the graph. So focusing on contents that are not uh, necessarily repositories, these registries, funded databases, and let's say other kind of sources do play a crucial role in creating uh, the contextual information that is needed to uh, run different applications on top of the contents of the graph. Meaning that uh, this, the bare bibliographic uh, record of a publication contains already uh, significant information, but alone, might not be enough to run, uh, for example, uh, over comprehensive research assessment that aims uh, today uh, in the context of the open science movement to consider different aspects, so beyond publications. So that's why uh, we, often, we often stress on the need to uh, build the right context around the scientific production. And that's why in this sense, uh, funder databases play a crucial role but not only those, also ROAR as a registry of um, research performing organizations is important, just like ORCID uh, to provide a reliable uh, identification for persons, so authors of publications. In fact, uh, the construction of the graph leverages on top of, of these concepts. So uh, being defined in, in the most, uh, in one of the most, let's say, definitions, uh, the graph as a set of vertices or nodes and edges or relationships um, is crucial to uh, <clears throat> properly identify which are the records that take place in uh, the graph model depicted here in this slide. Uh, th this image directly comes from uh, the new uh, release of the website and describes the core uh, graph data model. One of the main challenges in the graph construction process is indeed uh, the non-ambiguous identification of the records that uh, take part in this data model. With this, I want to say uh, that there are, uh, of course, um, reliable identifiers out there, but often, they are not uh, uh, always available or um, maybe are known on some version of the data, but are not known on another version of the same data. So we uh, might, we have, uh, let's say in the early stages of the graph before the, the processing takes place, various identities for uh, what we'll find out at the end of, it, of the chain as being the same record. So that's why we have different fingerprints uh, depicted here. So the key message here is the one of the challenges is indeed uh, the non-ambiguous identification of the records that uh, we want to connect 
also in the graph with all these relations. So uh, I think uh, I thought to provide a couple of examples that uh, could give you an understanding on how uh, a bibliographic record in this case uh, is a reduced version of a data set. Uh, I got it from Zenodo and got rid of the non-necessary information. How this bibliographic record uh, takes part uh, to the graph construction process. So out of this record, there is uh, essentially a mapping that uh, transforms it into various uh, elements or components of the graph. We have for sure one research product, which is the starting point here, the data set. In this case, it is identified by a, a DOI. As I said, uh, DOIs are available, but not always. Uh, so, but when they are available, we do uh, leverage on that. It creates one or more persons in, intended as authors. Here we have the ORCID of my colleague Paolo. Following uh, below the bibliographic record, we have relations with other uh, records. In this case, we see that the relation is expressed uh, in the related identifier element where DOIs are provided. So being, again, another uh, reliable persistent identifier, it's possible to um, take for granted that OpenAI will have also this node in the graph. So we can uh, surely build a relation, a relation pointing to that. In this case, the versioning relation. Um, the, uh, the creator element also uh, included uh, information about uh, the affiliation of Paolo Mai. In this case, uh, my institute, the institute where I also work, Institute of Science and Technology at the Italian National Research Council. So this information, again, based on a persistent ID, allows to create uh, an affiliation relation. Last but not least, uh, the funding reference section here includes two uh, references to two projects from the European Commission that allows them to create a reference to uh, these projects that are in instead provided by another source, but we know that they are part of the graph. So from uh, the European Commission, we get then uh, the description of the projects. So in this case, uh, the descriptors contain uh, the metadata that describes this particular project and the list of participants. Uh, there are one generally or more participant. In this, in this example, there is only one participant. So out of this uh, metadata record, uh, it contributes to, in the, to the graph construction process to one project and a number of organizations, along with the relationships uh, among them. So we know which organization participate to which projects. The last example, finally, is um, an example uh, extracted from the raw uh, database of an organization from which uh, we get uh, research performing organization and a number of uh, hierarchical relations as uh, ROAR also informs on uh, the parent-child relationships occurring uh, from, for example, a large research institution like the CNR and all its sub-institutes that are then uh, represented in the data as children. So, about the non-compatible sources and the relationship with the compatible ones. Um, the difference uh, here is essentially on uh, what to uh, drive as validation process. Because if for open compatible sources, we do uh, a full support from the open guidelines, uh, we cannot exactly say the same for uh, the non-compatible sources. So it's not yet 100% uh, clear on how to express this uh, validation 
there are uh, ongoing discussions at the European Commission level, and in, in this sense, EOSC, uh, the European Open Science Cloud, will drive some uh, some lines on which are the requirements for the, the validation. But essentially, this is the main difference. If for uh, open air compatible sources, uh, the guidelines uh, draw a line on how to interpret the content on what can be considered to be in and what is then not. For the rest, uh, it's a more uh, blurry area. Then, uh, as I was mentioning before, the takeaway message and some numbers. The, the content aggregation uh, counts today roughly 2,000 uh, active data sources from which OpenAir collects regularly. These uh, activities, these workflows count roughly uh, 8,000 uh, weekly aggregation workflows uh, divided uh, across uh, metadata collection and metadata transformation, resulting in uh, failures and successes. Uh, the tooling that I described before allows the um, aggregator uh, operators to uh, get an understanding on the causes of the failures and track of the, of course, the successful executions. Then uh, as the graph gets published roughly every once, uh, one time per month, uh, the largest data sources are uh, not updated that frequently. Uh, I mean, not uh, on a weekly basis, but, uh, more uh, to be in line with the graph releases. So for example, uh, Crossref is updated once per month, just like uh, the graph. The metadata formats included for which uh, there are parsers implemented uh, include for the large Dublin core and uh, data sites. So exposed by repositories as uh, OAI DC and OAI data site formats. There are many other uh, formats involved, luckily still uh, in the scope of being uh, numer enumerable, but this is indeed a challenge for the sustainability of the processes. Of course, the, the more the different formats that the system must uh, handle, the more the complexity, uh, the intrinsic complexity. So uh, ongoing and future work. So what, what is happening uh, behind the curtains? Uh, the relation with the European Open Science Cloud is essentially driving some requirements uh, that are uh, we foresee that are going to imply stricter content acquisition policies. What we do foresee is that the repos repositories that are still uh, marked as driver compatible. So the original compatibility that, uh, that was devised uh, many years ago, be even before OpenAir uh, was started as a, as a project, as a pilot, will uh, only aggregated uh, through base. So the aggregator operated by University of Bielefeld. In this sense, the requirements are uh, getting inspired from what we're getting uh, from the EOSC. Another important aspect is to uh, strengthen the data flow and content monitoring to better support the um, aggregator operators in uh, essentially being able to run quality assurance uh, at every single stage of the data processing pipeline, starting from the early stages of content acquisition. Uh, over the years, uh, a bit of experience on these, uh, these activities has shown that uh, playing the role of an aggregator is, on a, is not an easy task, especially when there are so many uh, providers involved. Providers that have their own autonomy in uh, running updates of their platforms or uh, being on terms of also service availability, the spectrum of cases that uh, we had to, to 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 face over the year over the years is quite high, and uh, it happened uh, that contents 
from repositories that were undergoing maintenance or uh, any possible technical cause, uh, well, these appeared also on OpenAir, just to give you one of the most uh, uh, important events that could occur. So uh, it's important to strengthen these uh, activities, quality assurance activities, to be notified at very early stages on uh, events that are significant for uh, the graph construction pipeline. And also to uh, better the timing in the delivery of the contents. So uh, this closes my presentation. Uh, I hope I did not uh, took more time that uh, I was assigned. Let me remember uh, the resources that you will find, the information that you will find on the new uh, Open uh, Graph website and uh, the forum where uh, you can start discussions uh, to get in touch with the Open Earth Graph team to uh, discuss uh, vision, uh, troubleshooting, uh, exchanging ideas, any sort of discussion that you believe could be fruitful also for others. Uh, feel free to initiate it there. And again, thank you. Thank you very much, Claudio. Um, we we starting having uh, quite a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I've seen there's a lot of uh, activity in the shared document. Um, so I suggest to start uh, we with the first one, and uh, um, I'll uh, I'll give the floor to the audience. If if you want to raise your hand, uh, Yannick Viard, you 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 ask two questions in the um, in the chat. But uh, if you also want to to speak up, you're welcome to to open your mic. Otherwise, I can read the question. OK, no problem. Hello. Uh, do you hear uh, me? Yes. Beatrice Coppola, and I'm from Finland, from Alto University. Uh, raising my, like, opening my mind for a direct question to the Open IRA team. So uh, are you? uh involved or uh, are you aware or is this open air forum uh or team can uh support me with the question re regarding our finnish national open uh, science portal data integration to open air so we had a call last week with csc who confirmed that uh, the Finnish universities, the Finnish research outputs will be will be transferred to OpenIRA via integration during this year. So is that uh, in uh, will that data uh, goes through same validation process what Claudia ra Claudio raised and 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 presented today? Or um, is that validation process what you presented in your presentation referring just to the manually added or, or the collected from different data sources uh, like open data sources, data validation process? Let me try to, um, to answer you. to this. Um, well, uh, I'm not directly uh, involved in the discussion with uh, with you or with the um, creation of, of a Finnish monitoring dashboard. Yeah. But the experience I had in this regard and following the various discussion threads uh, internal to open air, yeah. there, I think there is a, an important aspect to, to, to underline here. Um, as the material that can be of interest of a, to a particular country may maybe vary from country to country as different countries could mm -hmm. uh, as full uh, legitimate legitimately have their own autonomy in defining uh, just to give you an example mm -hmm. uh, which products should be taken into consideration for research assessment yeah uh, 
uh, I think this uh, discussion is uh, also larger than, than open air. And uh, of course, a common understanding, maybe cross country understanding on mm. uh, which uh, could be a set of basic inclusion rules mm. uh, could be something that could be worth discussing. I know some uh, that there are already monitoring dashboards, uh, country based. The, the, we do have one that we are working on for Italy. Uh, another one for Ireland uh, is also being uh, released. Uh, we'll see. It, it's crucial uh, to confront with other uh, local initiatives to understand which are uh, the differences, because uh, these differences might be due to various reasons. But uh, everything starts on which products are of interest for, for, for the given country. Mm -hmm. So I, I suggest you to maybe get in touch with Julia Malaguarnera also. Uh, I know she's following these discussions closely and mm -hmm. we can surely have a follow-up on this. Thank you. That would be really great because uh, this is the reason we had that uh, call with our uh, collaborator and colleagues at CSC. So from my perspective, from the technical team, uh, I don't know to what extent uh, Open Air is in the position or, or can have the possibility to adjust the inclusion rules on a mm -hmm. country basis. Yes. Because the same product, uh, considering the multidisciplinarity mm -hmm. of the science today, could be of interest for more than one country. Exactly. So we are not, we are not mm -hmm. talking just about uh, in on or out uh, rule for a given research product. Yes, and so, Claudio, it can be uh, when talking multidisciplinary, multidisciplinarity, but also collaborative uh, research. Exactly, exactly. So when you understand. collaborate, uh, there are products, research outputs with uh, different countries, universities collaboration. So how 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 about those cases? Exactly. Yes, thank you. Uh, if you can chat me, uh, Julius, can you put to the chat, Julius? Or, or somewhere to send uh, to Beatrice Koponen or, or to, to, to see her name. So the contact name would... Of course. Thank you. Okay, so I, I, I can read Yannick uh, Biard uh, questions. Um, the first one is, uh, are data articles harvested as well? like those published by data in brief and this is a, um, uh, and then uh, they provide a link to an elsevier uh, journal um, called uh, data in brief so articles about data are they harvested not that i know i i know that science direct is not a direct data source uh, by itself, we might have some of its contents via Crossref, maybe, if they are open, and it seems the case. But I, I can check more in detail. Okay. If if an article is in Crossref, it should be also in open air, just like if it's in the in data site. So I don't know this particular journal, the contents from this particular journal but uh, I can check. Okay, and and I guess a, a, a similar answer uh, is for uh, other data sets available under open licenses in institutions open repositories. And an example from France is the, um, yeah, the, the, the French institution repository. Mm. So do you have other... Uh, uh, no, it's the same answer. I, I don't know by surely by heart, but uh, that's an investigation I can I can do. Okay, we have uh, uh, just just to uh, just to I mean a message to to this is valid for all the question. Uh, for the particular cases, uh, we will follow up in the in the shared documents. So if Claudio can uh, can check directly this this link and the journals that have been mentioned. Uh, then we can give a more precise answer 
uh, in the notes that we will share with all the participants. Okay. Um, anybody else from the audience that want to um, directly um, ask a question or? I can uh, give it a try if you want. Oh, sure. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, Alban Thomas from INRAE. Um, I can just answer first to previous question because I also use uh, Anthropo uh, Recherche, Recherche Data Gouv. Uh, it's uh, available in, in open air. But um, my question was about um, a set of data inside of these repositories. I can see data sets from uh, Recherche Data Gouv, but I cannot see um, our um, data set, uh, our set of uh, data inside this repository. Uh, I mean, I cannot see only our data sets from our organization inside. I am. Am I clear enough? Let Let me see if I understood your mm. um, your concern. Um, you are expecting to find. Uh, uh, a given uh, number of set data sets mm. that you know are available in HAL, yeah. but you are not finding them in, in open air. I cannot find them, uh, only them. I don't find a way to get only uh, items from our organization. Uh, OK, so your concern is about how to put them under a um, a given umbrella that is one of your organization. My question was more about uh, if I have uh, to ensure that the, um, this collection, this set of data implies these gu guidelines, or is it uh, the repository managers to ensure uh, the set of data complies with them? Well, um, yeah, so uh, if they are aggregated directly from how then it should be the source, uh, so HAL itself, to comply with the open guidelines. Mm -hmm. However, uh, so far, uh, open have been quite, let's say, permissive in the degree of compliance. Uh, that's why uh, the closing of the presentation, I mentioned that we do foresee, uh, we do envision uh, the implementation of stricter uh, acquisition rules. Mm -hmm. An, an alternative way uh, is to have the same contents available on, on another repository, uh, maybe directly managed by your institution, where maybe you have more freedom to uh, adjust uh, the contents to uh, the, the open air guidelines. Uh, Otherwise, I'm, it, I mean... I, I'm sure, uh, I, I don't think I, I've been clear enough, sorry, for that. Uh, I mean, we, our organization has a set uh, inside uh, the repository, meaning this belongs to us. And I cannot access only to this uh, particular uh, set of items. And yes, but th this is exposed okay. by HAL uh, as yeah. a repository. Yeah. And So I, uh, I don't know if in HAL it's possible to curate how the data in a given set, in a particular set, is exposed mm. to the world. Okay, it it, it may be a, a matter of uh, quality of data. You In mean? general, yes. Uh, okay. So it depends on the repository platform implement specific implementation. Uh, to, uh, okay. I admit I don't know if this is a possibility yeah, I, I to, do to to run curation or to expose the contents okay. of a particular set think... in a particular way, different from other sets. Okay, I didn't think about this. Uh, and just to finish, uh, should I check in OpenR Provide to check these matters? Is, is this uh, my charge or, or should I ask for all uh, managers to, to check? I suggest you to first uh, do a, some searches on OpenR Explore and yeah, see if you can, you can find, uh, okay, uh, the contents of your interest and get in touch maybe with the manager or HAL to check if it's already registered. It's an ongoing process, uh, work. 
Thank you. Okay. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you. We have Inge next. Inge, would you like to? I yes, I can uh, do it or, uh, orally. Um, now, uh, thanks a lot for all the information. I find it uh, very uh, valuable as always. And uh, I just have a few questions about things you said about compatibility of uh, repositories. Um, namely, first of all, that uh, for uh, quality assurance, um, driver repositories from only from base would be considered. Um, what does it mean? Uh, what does it mean towards the ones that are driver version one, two, three, four? Uh, how do I, do we interpret that information? Um, and the second thing, yeah. maybe that is connected to that, if you look at compatibility of repositories, um, the things you said about EOS, um, that makes it more and more important, increasingly important to be open air compliant, if I'm correct, if you could expand on that. Uh, yes, thanks Inge for uh, raising this point. Uh, now, now I do realize that maybe I didn't put it in uh, uh, giving the right angle because I mentioned uh, the stricter rules and the acquisition only from base of the driver compatible uh, data sources, but uh, the higher compliance level, so starting from Opener 2 on, onwards and up to the most recent uh, version four uh, of the guidelines will still be considered as compatible and will be therefore uh, supported to provide. So the change in this sense will only regard uh, repositories that are still, uh, let's say only driver compliant. Those records will wave through to open air through base. This is the idea. And we are uh, now at the stage of uh, understanding which is the coverage, which is which are the gaps with respect to the sources that are actually uh, proactively aggregated uh, by open air. Again, that are uh, driver compliant. Regarding what the EC is doing uh, with regards to uh, what the EC will uh, provide as an indication for what we consider uh, as non-compatible sources. Also to me, th th this is uh, my understanding. I think it's a, a bit limited, uh, to be honest. I see this uh, as a moving part and it also relates uh, with uh, setting up which are requirements, considering the various stakeholders. It's a, I think it's not an easy task to, to, to run. And Probably it's a discussion for an a, a higher level. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I asked. I was like, um, where do I situate it? But then, then I know enough. Uh, thanks for uh, this. But while I'm here, may I ask another question? Sure. Um, now I I hear a lot about time posting and event notification as an exchange format for interoperability. Um, and how far is this on the roadmap? But to integrate it, or or how do we deal with time posting and event notification? I'm not a technical person, so I don't know that much about it. But I, I hear our uh, development team talk about that a lot, and I just wanted to know how, at this point in time, um, this is included or how it's dealt with. Can Can you repeat the core of your question? Yeah. Sorry. Sign signposting and uh, event notification, like uh, as a exchange for exchanging information. Ah, okay. Signposting and uh, okay. Uh, I know this protocol is being taken into account in some uh, projects that Opener is involved with, and um, I know that the idea is to uh, support it to let, uh, let's say, a given repository to. Uh, push metadata about a given research output directly to open air without basically bypassing the traditional uh, metadata harvesting that today runs uh, leverages on OEIPMH. So these, in theory, this could allow for a more timely delivery of contents and more up-to-date synchronization between repositories that do implement 
uh, this protocol and open air. There are implications though on the general design yeah. because, because uh, uh, the aggregation process now uh, gets snapshotted uh, every month. So we take a picture of the current state at a given moment in time to spot the duplicates set and to run uh, analytics to calculate the statistics. So these are batch processes that are very uh, resource consuming. And of course, if we have uh, orthogonally other records, other information coming in, uh, in a, let's say real time fashion, this, uh, this information, these records could not benefit from uh, the duplication to, to, for, for example, or cannot take part to cannot be taken into account for the calculation of statistics. So uh, on one end, it would be good, I think, to have uh, a more uh, up-to-date and fresh information, uh, but probably the services will need to be adapted to differentiate the various, the different functionalities. Okay. So we Thank need to, care to carefully evaluate uh, the possibilities here. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, we, we have another question about the detailed, uh, is there a detailed list of sources already harvested, compatible by Aurelie? Uh, I, I think, the, yes, we, we can uh, the, redirect uh, uh, you to the, uh, to the documentation uh, page on the website. Uh, no, I think this is a good question because uh, this is in the plan to uh, expose a comprehensive list. This is not yet visible. I mean, there are some sources that are mentioned there, but uh, I think we mentioned this sometimes in the past that, again, for the sake of transparency, the portal, the graph portal should expose a complete list of sources indicating the name of the source, maybe the PIDs, uh, open door, other data for sharing, and the last update date of the contents. Because on provide, you have, uh, access, you have access to the, an individual repository provided that you are registered. Instead, on the graph website, uh, we should have like a table in a, in a dedicated page, a long table listing all the sources that OpenAIR collects directly. It's in the plan. Okay. Okay, next one, uh, Pascaline Chosseno. Um, how to improve metadata concerning organization affiliation in data already collected in open air. For example, there are a lot of variants for my organization. And uh, uh, if we go to uh, explore, uh, uh, if we go to open air explore and, uh, and check for the, mm. the specific lab, if remember, there are a lot yeah, the, the, there are maybe, I mean, there are three pages of um, uh, organizations. I copy the link in the chapter yes, yes, audio yes. If, you, if you want to have Yes, yes, I'm seeing that. Yes. So thanks, Pascaline, for this question. Um, well, this is indeed one uh, good example of, of the issue I mentioned during the presentation, the precise uh, identification of the records that we want to take into account in doing uh, our job. So Open Air tackles this uh, issue with uh, another dedicated service, uh, which uh, started to be uh, operated a couple of years ago. And it's named Open Orgs, and essentially allows to uh, delegate the curation of the, these ambiguities in the identification of the research performing organizations to uh, metadata curators. I can uh, point you to a new website that is being uh, evaluated now towards beta orgs. Uh, I, I will pass the links I don't have in, the, in my browser ready. 
But if you want to know how OpenAI tackles this problem about uh, the variant of a given organization, you will find answers there. And you can get in touch with us if you're interested to collaborate with that initiative. Thank you. Yes, the, the, the website is in the beta version. So yep. um, maybe we can uh, we can give updates on uh, on the status of this in, in our uh, in our next uh, in our next calls, but uh, we can definitely uh, link uh, resources uh, to to understand what what this initiative is about, and also because we need curators, right, for uh, for the um, for highlighting uh, organization in each countries and um, and make sure that uh, the the affiliations are uh, are listed correctly. So, oh yes, I see that someone is typing uh, and, and, and give the link. Thank yeah, you. I, I found the link. Ah, ah you, yeah, <laughs> great, great. Um, I, we don't have uh, questions left and we are also uh, past the time uh, of, the, of the meeting. So uh, I think, uh, I think Athena, uh, do, do you have closing remarks? You did. <laughs> Thanks a lot for uh, joining everyone. I think we can wrap this up. I've shared the link to the slides uh, in this chat and also the link for the registration for our next call, which is on Wednesday 20th of March at the same time, 11 a.m. CET. So we're looking forward to uh, seeing you there as well. We will follow up with uh, the notes, the slides, the recording and all useful information. And well, thank you once more. Uh, I think that's it. See you at the next one. Thanks a lot, everyone. Goodbye. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you also from my side. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you.